good enough. That's some discipline. That's some discipline. You're listening to Heart Beat Radio. And this is Bob Johnson coming to you live from Calgary, Alberta, Canada at the Heart Beat Radio Studios. We're going to be uh, having part three of our uh, Heart Beat Radio that we did part one and two this weekend. And we're going to finish off with Matt Mers from Portland Wrestling. I'm excited to uh, to finish this up with Bruce and uh, talk about the third generation of uh, Heart family members competing in the squared circle for our enjoyment. I'd like to turn over to the host of our show, who's actually our guest uh, for part three, Mr. Bruce Hurt. Welcome back to Heartbeat Radio, Bruce. Hi, guys. Uh, nice to be here to uh, participate tonight. So, uh... Well, I want to get started by talking about this third generation of children in the Hart family. Uh, and how did it come about that Natalia and Teddy and Harry uh, approached you about training? Did they each approach you separately on their own? Did they all kind of come as a group, or how did that work, Bruce? I think they were intrigued and fascinated with it. You know, just uh, it was kind of a prevalent time for the Hearts back then. Uh, this is back in the the nineties. With uh, Brett was champion and they had the big show in Calgary called the Canadian Stampede which was uh, one of the most successful shows of the year in 97 and they had seen their uncles Brett and uh, Owen and Davy Boy and uh, around that time I was I was still training guys you know I had trained uh, all through the 80s and early 90s we had everyone from Pillman to Benoit to later Jericho and uh, they were kind of fascinated buy it. I think Owen's son at that time was a bit too young. Davy Boy's son, Harry, uh, who later became David Hart Smith in the WWE or F or whatever, um, he was uh, always wanting to kind of follow in Davy's footsteps, so Davy kind of uh, hooked him up with me and we kind of uh, proceeded. And my sister's daughter, Natalie, who they changed her name to Natalia, Nightheart's daughter, she was kind of half fascinated with it. And then my uh, nephew, Ted, whose real name is Ted Annis, and my brother-in-law, B.J. Annis, that's his father. So he got involved, and they all had pretty uh, good handle of the business, which makes a heck of a difference, you know, just sort of understanding it, you know, because it's totally different in actuality than... Yeah what it appears to be so but that was a huge head start and uh they all kind of uh got in they were probably teenagers at that time and uh it kind of followed from there and ted had a a buddy named tj wilson who uh was later renamed tyson kid when he got to wwe and uh there's a few other guys that were on. on uh, I had a really talented black guy up here from Louisiana who was, uh, you know, I, I thought he had as much potential as Dwayne Johnson, who was around at that time, too. He was sort of uh, playing for the Calgary Stampeders football team up here, and I had known him in Hawaii back in the earlier part of the 80s. You know, his father had started up here, Rocky Johnson, and, and uh, his who grandfather. Who was the black trainee you had? Bruce? This guy's named Robbie Dix. He was uh, had more potential than almost any of those guys. He was a national amateur champion, and uh, he had been a double for Michael Jordan in the Space Jam movies. And he had a ton of athletic ability, and he had really uh, incredible charisma. He had, you know, that kind of real uh, reminded me of a Eddie Murphy type. You know, really uh, charismatic and lots of swagger and all like that. And, and a real legitimate tough guy, you know, and uh, he had all the, uh, seemingly all the tools. And I think my dad got him set up with WWE, and I have no doubt that he would have maybe transcended to become maybe the first bona fide black world champion or superstar. And uh, I'm not sure what happened. He got into some kind of uh, trouble, ended up getting arrested down in Louisiana for something, and uh uh, sad to relate, he hung himself in jail. That's terrible. And it was kind of uh, anybody who uh, 
saw him though uh, at that stage. You know, I remember uh, Owen and Davey were blown away. You know, he had uh, it seemed like he had all the uh, potential in the world, and uh, it was kind of a sad, uh, unfortunate uh, outcome. You know. I, and all these kids were actually still learning in the dungeon. At that time, your parents still owned the home? Yeah. And it was it was uh, a great learning, uh, you know, environment. The great, and Stu was down there, uh, you know, quite often he would come down. And uh, he always enjoyed just offering perspective. You know, he's kind of like the uh, maybe Moses coming down from <laughs> Mount Sinai and kind of... <laughs> That's one of the biggest things that's threatening the future of our business is the, uh, you know, the passing on of knowledge from one generation to the next. And uh, you can tell, see the subtle nuances and the little innate things that guys are doing in the ring that reflect whether they get it or don't get it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, more often than not, they don't have a damn clue. You know, they were going out with these scripted, uh, ster- sterile uh, matches that, you know, they they, they might be uh, choreographed to the T and everything, but they don't seem to incorporate the fans into the equation, which is, you know, what the main objective of the whole thing is, you know. And uh, um, well, Let me ask you a, a little bit about that, Bruce, because you, yeah. you trained all of these kids, I mean, including Rick Victor, um, I know Mike Modest came up there in 2001 and 2002 to learn yeah, from you. Yeah, he was up here, and Chris Daniels and uh, um, Sabu was up here for a bit helping them. And uh, What are the strong points to each of these kids in your family, starting with Natalia, uh, where you saw her began, uh, begin to what you see now in the ring on WWE programming each and every week? I trained all those guys, and they were, they were probably better when they uh, left here than – a few years later, you know, the, the WWE was uh, almost deprogrammed them and like, no, 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 you got to do it this way. And they they had to go to Ohio Valley and do all this other. Uh, they were already better when they started there than they were a few years later. But a um, big part of the biz- business, big part of almost any sport is just understanding what the objective of it is. And... Uh, in wrestling, you know, it's it's kind of a, a dichotomy because what it is and uh, what the fans perceive it to be are two totally different things. But it's really astonishing to me. But uh, even when I did WrestleMania a few years ago, you talked to some of the young guys and the up-and-coming guys, and uh, a lot of them don't understand or they've never been uh, kind of uh, taught the uh, aspects of ring psychology and what we used to refer to as getting it or understanding what working was all about. And it's, it's pretty simple, but uh, it should be very intuitive, um, you know, where you sort of sense what's getting over and what's not getting over. And, and you uh, develop your character and, uh, you know, fine tune it and all like that. And it's all very interactive. You know, anyone who's been in the business knows that it's about, uh, you and your opponent and the fans and it's this interactive kind of uh mix where you're all kind of uh working with each other and the fans obviously don't you know i I think subliminally they maybe realize that they're you know part of the equation but they don't even really want to perceive themselves as such but it's all about kind of uh storytelling you know and uh building to a climax and letting the crowd kind of uh, intrinsically feel like they're part of it, which is what they derive satisfaction. And just like any fan at any sporting event, if if they feel that they're doing the wave or cheering or wearing team colors or whatever, you know, uh, has a bearing on the outcome, then they're obviously going to be far more inclined to do it. WWE, you know, is kind of sterilized the fans with with some of the ill-conceived uh and needless kind of uh declarations that it's entertainment and it's pre-orchestrated and all this other type of stuff all they've done is made it that much harder but uh it's also kind of confused and perverted the perceptions of the wrestlers themselves in the old days uh you know you 
he had maybe four or five matches on a card, and it was kind of sequentially built up to the uh, the main event. But uh, more often than not, guys, you know, in the the main event and the so-called semi wind up the match just below the main event would it was routine for them to go 30 40 minutes during which time they were telling a story and kind of uh building to the climax and getting each other's stuff over and these days i see very little of that you know and that that's kind of uh when you hear of the uh, supposed great workers you know that w- that was what they're working uh Acumen was all about the, the, you know, the Dory and Terry Funks and the Harley races and the the Ric Flairs and the, you know, Billy Robinsons and Hinoki and guys like that, you know. Uh, Who do you think the the best workers in WWE are today? I think Randy Orton's obviously one of the better ones. I, I thought Daniel Bryan was uh, excellent. You know, he, he didn't do anything all that. Uh, awe-inspiring or whatever, but he had a really innate sense of ring psychology, how to work the crowd. And, um, he was one of those guys who subliminally enabled the crowd to uh, feel like they're cheering and whatever else had a pronounced bearing on the outcome, which is why he was over so much, because he was, you know, giving it back to the crowd, you know, and I'm astonished that more guys don't seem to get that. You know, like if I was one of the up-and-coming guys, I'd be saying, geez, uh, Daniel Bryan uh, was over probably as strong as anyone in the last 20 years. You know, he he was over in his prime as much as Hogan was or uh, Ultimate Warrior or Brett or any of them, you know, and, uh, and yet you take a step back and say he's not that big or he's not that... Uh, awe-inspiring or his finish was not all that mind-boggling or anything uh, so what what uh gets him over and it's, it's simple you know but uh it, it begs the question why don't more of these other guys do it or why doesn't the office uh encourage them to be interacting more with the crowd one of the For old a more babies. modern fan would you would you say it's fair to equate like a, a jerry lawler and how he really does get in the ring and tell a story um, completely using pantomime and incorporates the crowd into it. Yeah. And it's all when and uh, in what context you do things that makes it get over. Too many of these guys have this misconception that uh, more is better. So you get a pop. Mm. I think people one, fail one to one realize that the most interesting and fascinating thing in the entire world to look at is a human face. Uh, and and a lot of these guys forget that. They know how to do a million different types of flips off the top rope, uh, but they don't know how to use their face and their body language to convey emotions, um, which is really what a professional wrestling match is. And at least when I was a kid, that was 60% of it, at least, if not more. Oh, yeah, and a big part of it these days is it's, they, they've kind of got to the point where they uh, invariably let anything go so back in the days to get incredible heat you know it, was, it sounds stupid <laughs> by today's standards but if you threw a guy if a guy was thrown over the top rope it was a dq so uh well, yeah because in real life that would hurt a man legitimately yeah so uh and uh, you've brought but, this up on previous shows uh, about yeah. you know back then a baby face would walk out he'd be wearing a pair of red trunks or black trunks or white trunks oh, and yeah. that was it he had no flair that was for the heels. Um, yeah, and I, I can't find either way. You always were reminding people, this is what wrestling is, so that when someone did break the rules, uh, it got such a, a, a much larger reaction from that fan base because they were educated to know what wrestling on a mat is and that that's oh. what it's supposed to be. And it, and it still should be, you know. Like you take, I, I've said it before, but you take any other sport, you, such as baseball, you may have had some innovations like artificial turf or you got designated hitters or you got, uh, you know, some other little tweaks to the, uh, but baseball is still baseball, you know, nine innings, three outs, uh, whoever gets the most runs, if you hit it over the fence, it's a home run. Pretty basic, you know, they haven't deviated, but in wrestling, needlessly, they've, uh, you know, deviated tremendously for no reason to the point where 
all they do is confuse, disillusion the fans and uh, kind of uh, ultimately make it that much harder for themselves to uh, get a reaction. It's what you make of it, but it drives me nuts when I see one of the biggest aberrations I ever see is when they have a whole card of tables, ladders, chairs. It begs the first question is there's not even any pre-existing issues between any of these supposed opponents, and yet they're having these extreme rules, you know, which defeats the whole, it's counteractive to the whole point of the whole thing. In the old days, you'd only have a, a cage match or some extreme match like a lumberjack or a no disqualification Texas death match or some such thing. You'd build up to it for weeks, months, you know, or whatever, and it was finally like the big penultimate blow-off. And uh, it served a purpose. It's counteractive to any kind of rational, you know, logical booking when you're having a ladder match or a whole card of ladder matches and, uh, yeah. and, and you know, whatever the hell between guys who don't even have that many issues like back in the day when you had a cage match and even the WWE's format for the cage match to me is an abortion too like uh, they reward the guy who escapes and you're shaking your head and saying the whole point of excuse my friends the fucking uh, cage match is to keep them in the ring so you can uh, have a you know a finish you know, yeah. a pin or a, a submission or some such thing. I don't so think instead, I, I haven't. I don't know the last time I saw that. Yeah, but uh, so, so now they have like guys, uh, you know, escaping out of the little door, climbing out, and being rewarded. Whoever hits the ground first wins, or whatever. <laughs> and you're, and I'm calling this, you know, that contradicts the whole point of the whole thing. The point you shouldn't be rewarding the guy who escaped and you know, the chicken shit coward who ran out. You know, he should be rewarding the guy who finally vanquished his opponent in the ring, pinned him in the middle, whatever, you know, and you had some kind of uh, sense of justice or whatever, you know, but uh, it, I shouldn't even be having to point those things out to them. They should they should know that stuff implicitly themselves. Well, one of the first things they ever teach you is always have a reason or if somebody asks you why you had them being as vaudevillians or uh, Martians or whatever the hell, you should be able to explain your rationale. You know, well, you know, yeah. people are into that, or you know, it's it's a hot button topic in the world these days. You know, uh, <laughs> or something. You know, there. But when you have guys doing things that seem to have nothing to do whatsoever with anything, don't elicit any type of uh, response or reaction, and uh, they don't complement or interact with anybody they're working with, then, uh, you know, it begs the question, why the hell are you doing it? Like, what, what you know, if I was in the room and somebody say, I got this awesome idea of having these two guys doing some vaudeville charade from, you know, pre-1920, you know, pre-Charlie Chaplin or whatever the hell. Uh, and I'd say, okay, cool, whatever, it's different, whatever, but what the hell has it got to do with any, any contemporary? Is there some prevailing issue that evokes some kind of an emotional response? You know, are you going to get pissed off? Are you going to celebrate or become euphoric or something? If you can't explain or, you know, give a good excuse or reason for whatever, then maybe, uh, you know, you shouldn't be doing it. You know, it's it's pretty simple. You know, it shouldn't need too much embellishment or, you know, explanation to uh, figure that out. But I I see all kinds of that uh, these days. I see the guys doing some pretty interesting stuff, but... uh, so much of it seems like sticking a square peg in a round hole. Like, uh, I thought Bray Wyatt was getting over a bit, but I frank that whole thing got to the point where nothing seemed to pertain. It was all just kind of half-assed with 
you know, Braun Strowman and Luke Harper and Eric Rowan and the Sheephead and all the, you know, whatever the hell. And after a while, I was like, uh, maybe I'm missing something here. What am I supposed to be uh, reacting to or what, you know, is there some symbolic uh, implication or something here, you know? Once you get kind of confused or disillusioned, the next thing, you know, I found with fans is they just generally tend to tune you out. And uh, I see too much of that where they're doing everything but wrestling. Well, Bruce, let me ask you this. If you were booking the show, not with a team of people like they have, no Freddie Prince Jr. looking over your shoulder, what would you do with Natalia? In Natalia's case, maybe you should be able to take advantage of, you know, uh, just like they've done with uh, Charlotte Flair, you know. It seems to be more, it should be maybe a bit more association or connotation with the anvil. And by that token, maybe Brett too, you know. And uh, I think the girls, for me, need to be, uh, frankly, doing more wrestling and less high spots, you know. Most of them uh, do virtually no wrestling. Everything's these sterile, choreographed, uh, over-rehearsed high spots. They're cheerleader routines. Yeah, and uh, one of the main things I do in the WWE is they have all these people, not just girls, but guys, most of whom can't articulate or get to the point or express anything. And in the old days, you had a guy like uh, Mean Gene or you had uh, some of these guys who were, you know, I know we had a guy up here in uh, Ed Whalen and good interviewers, and they would get right to the point and... uh, what drives me nuts these days is most of the guys couldn't hold a candle to the good interviewers of the past. You know, there's not too many Nick Bockwinkles out there, or, you know, uh, guys like Ric Flair and Johnny Valentine and those those guys, Roddy Piper, guys like that were really, uh, you know, it was what they were really good at. And um, yes. I see these guys just uh, yakking, you know, f- nobody cutting them off and, uh, and nobody's even sure sure what direction they're going or what you know what the point is or whatever you know and uh, so but it seems like but, they're just going pay per view to pay per view with no real sense of anything other than okay yeah, WrestleMania uh, we got to yeah, do this I think there's for me there's way too many pay per views got to the point where you know uh, in the old days you know uh, I first likened it to WrestleMania it was like the Super Bowl of and, or the World Series or something. It was the big penultimate blow-off or whatever. And then they uh, got to the point where they had um, SummerSlam and they had Royal Rumble and they had uh, Survivor Series. So you had. So then I likened it to like the uh, the Grand Slam of tennis or golf where you had the Masters and the U.S. Open and the PGA yeah. and the British Open. But then and it got to the point where it was... Uh, every other month and then every month and now that's like every two weeks <laughs> and, and all vying for you know they they seem to go from one thing and back to another like they they finally unified the world title a few years ago then they decided okay we're gonna go back to now having the you know the they now have a belt the universal championship the universal right? uh, yeah and yeah, man, I yeah, saw a great and, I saw a great match on Jupiter last month, Bruce. He would have been blown away. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, Neptune is next or some shit. It is, but, uh, yeah. Then they're gonna go <laughs> straight up Uranus. And yeah, that's a good. Uh, I could have put it better, but I uh, then yeah, have, still not uh, over. nobody gives Intercontinental <laughs> and United States and cruiserweight and divas and uh, you know, all, you know. After if you're while, the champion you know, of every living creation and galaxy in the entire universe and no one gives a shit, you're in trouble. You know, you don't need to go back to uh, square one, which is wrestling. Yeah. You need if to everybody in, in America got to get a free Mickey Mantle rookie card from the U.S. government, they, they wouldn't be worth anything anymore. No. You need, to, you need to reestablish the wrestling, and you need to go back to... Uh, you know, it sounds stupid, like, and it, maybe people think it sounds mundane. But it, it, you need you actually need to go back to reestablishing what's legal and what's illegal. For me, uh, after, when I see one of these abortion of uh, shows where everybody's uh, 
and damn near every match going out and throwing somebody into the so-called timekeeper's table and pulling, you know, it's almost laughable. You know, it's an effing joke where you have a hundred chairs under the ta- under the ring, <laughs> and, and then you go to one of these shows where you have so-called tables, ladders, chairs, and there's like a hundred ladders there and uh, and kendo sticks and well, you know, uh, all this other crap, you know that gets to the point where uh, wrestling has no apparent uh, bearing on any of it. You know, may as well pull it damn uh, somebody just pulls a gun out and shoots something else. Like, but it's, you know, it's it's all about kind of uh, reestablishing some perception of uh, whatever the hell the rules are. People just react. But if you took baseball, for example, and you had foul balls are now fair balls too, and, uh, you know, there's eight outs in an inning, and, uh, you know, they had in some matches, some games they have five bases instead of four and all this other bullshit. <laughs> it wouldn't make people more like, whoa, this is getting better. They got eight bases now, you know, they got uh, – 12 players on, in the field at a time where all it would do is kind of piss people off and they'd be going like uh, whoever is orchestrating all this shit uh, needs to get lost here. I'm, I'm opting for another sport, cricket or uh, you know lawn bowling or some bullshit. <laughs> and they need to uh, you know take a long look at what they're doing and uh, anything that doesn't serve the purpose of it enhancing the image and the marketability of wrestling should be uh scrapped you know whether it's uh long-winded pointless idiotic interviews or having six or nine or 12 or 14 announcers all screaming for you know the mic and talking over each other and if you yep. were in charge of WWE and you had this young, attractive, six foot four, maybe that's kayfabe, maybe it's not, 250 pound Harry Smith, third generation pedigree, incredible hunk of man that the ladies would love, what would you do with this guy when the average person would say, well, let's put the world belt on him? What would you do to get that young man over without having to use a belt? Pretty simple, you know. You. you, you you try to build on pre-existing issues. You know, I, I told Harry that, uh, you know, would would have made a been a pretty easy fit to uh, maybe mention, you know, that uh, one of Harry's father, Davy Boy, the British Bulldogs, you know, big rivals back in the day was Cowboy Bob Orton, you know, and he was mm-hmm. part of the match where Dynamite Kid got his... Uh, back broken, you know, he and Don Morocco and uh, so you already have a built in uh, kind of pretext for building it and then uh, the fact that uh, they've got this pre existing thing and, and the fact that Harry and uh Randy both being second generation, you know, have a really good sense of what working's all about, you know, interacting, getting each other's stuff over, you know, uh, establishing a finish and uh sustaining heat and all that you know that would have made you know for a an easy uh an easy fit you take some of those classic rivalries and uh you know uh like say rick flair and terry funk or uh back in the day harley and uh dory funk and those things would go on for years you know they were like uh bruno and uh say Ivan Koloff and guys like yeah. that uh, it was always you know a hot ticket you know and nowadays uh, it should be as soon as you mention a guy's name it immediately evokes another name like oh you know his, you know, his rivalry with so and so used to be like Hulk and Andre or uh, you know the Bulldogs and the Heart Foundation or Hawk and Animal with uh demolition or something like that you know but you don't see that anymore which is uh doesn't speak well of the of the booking and i think one of the biggest problems i i perceive you know i don't know what the, who's who or what is the chain of command sure. down there but I, to me there's way too many cooks in the kitchen and it's evidenced by the fact that you have something that maybe people take seriously and then you got some complete uh horseshit with uh mud bath or uh you know uh p 
people uh, doing comic relief crap, you know, and uh, they, they, uh, one thing counteracts another. And uh, all too often on these pay-per-views these days, uh, they have the main event in the uh, first match. Or like, after a while, you don't know what the hell you're supposed to react to, you know, which it shouldn't be like that, you know. Like if I'm going to a damn rock concert and they got the... Rolling Stones coming out first, and then you know some uh, no-name grunge band, you know <laughs> the, the last act or something like. Uh, what, you know what's going on here? Am I supposed to stay for this or is this? <laughs> but it, it should be pretty uh, systematic. You know the promoters should have a very pronounced perception of what it is they're seeking to uh, get re- reactions from, and uh, if they can't explain that or define that themselves and then there's a problem and I I all too often uh, kind of get that vibe. Let me ask you yeah. about the most controversial uh, pupil you've probably ever had and that would be your nephew Teddy Hart, a young man who is incredibly passionate about professional wrestling and does things in the ring that require you to have a rewind button. He's so impressive. Where does that young man's future fit in the wrestling business? Because he is quite a phenomenal specimen. Everything in this world is about picking your spots. If you're going to do something really incredible, don't do it all the time because it ceases to really have any great impact. You know, pick your spots, do it in the right context at the right time, in the right place, you know, uh, and it'll be etched in people's minds forever. But if you're doing it every damn night, and I remember seeing that poor Terry Brunk, uh, Sabu doing, you know, uh, and that was one of my issues. You know, he's an old friend of mine, but, uh, I'd be telling him the same, you know, uh, if you're doing it every damn night to the point where, uh, people almost expect it, don't, don't risk breaking your neck, breaking your leg, whatever, every night to appease a bunch of uh, effing morons who are going to go, holy shit, are you fucked up? Or, you know, like, uh, don't let the tail wag the dog. Do uh, do less, but when you do it, make it mean something. As I said before, you need to be able to define your objective or purpose. And uh, if it doesn't... Uh, seem to have any purpose or you know it doesn't have any real impact or whatever then you gotta scrap it one of the big problems is you know I refer to it as having like a bunch of eunuchs in a effing whore house you know you got a bunch of people that are in there that seemingly uh, make out to know all about it but they've never done it you know how how the hell are you gonna get a maximal response when you don't even quite know what the hell you're seeking to uh, get a response for or from, you know. And uh, you know that, that's one of the big problems. It's it's frustrating because it's like uh, Dickens said: the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, you know, with the internet and social media and all this stuff, the potential for marketing and propagating storylines, etc., is better than ever. And at the same time, you have a far more diluted, you know, less talented uh, group of wrestlers. And uh, Is it that they're less talented, or is it that they're just so restrained they're not able to fully exercise All all of the above. uh, um, They're less talented because they don't know what the hell they're, you know, like, as I said before, at some point somebody needs to take all the damn wrestlers and give them almost like a tutorial on what the hell wrestling is, how to get yourself over. This is what it is. This is what, how you uh, do it. This is what the aspects or, you know, variables of good, great working is and understanding the psychology and the interactive elements and all of that. And that's what we're going to do on a future episode of heartbeat radio. I think with you bruised is we're going to sit down and have, uh, you know, booking 101, and oh, yeah, really try to get it through people's skulls. Yeah, it, it's very systematic, and uh, anything that anyone tells you, you know, if you ask them uh, what the rationale is, they should be able to very clearly 
you know, uh, explain it to you. If they can't, then uh, maybe they're full of shit. Well, Bruce, I want to I want to thank you for being so open and honest during this epic shoot interview that we have uh, we've conducted here on Heartbeat Radio. It has been such a pleasure to uh, get to know both yourself and Bob over the last couple three years on this uh, fantastical magical mystery tour of professional wrestling. We're all traveling yeah. down together. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. I uh, it's it's nice to be able to talk to people that. Uh, are intelligent and understand it and, uh, you know, are endeavoring to uh, maybe uh, still see the business rise above all the uh, self-inflicted adversity it's, you know, had to overcome. So uh, even though I've got my issues, and rightfully with uh, WWE, um, I wish them uh, nothing but the best, frankly, because... you know, my family and um, my dad and everything is all about, you know, the legacy of the wrestling business. And, you know, by that token, uh, I'd far rather see the WWE uh, rise to great heights again. You know, any anybody who's a fan as I am, you know, would be going, I'd love nothing better than to see a bunch of a new generation of people like David Hart Smith and Randy Orton's and uh, guys like that, uh restoring respectability and credibility and uh, passion and all like that into the business because it would bode well for the future of the business.